Hi, and welcome to The Full Bloom Project, a body-positive parenting podcast dedicated to promoting emotional wellness in our children and health at every size for the whole family. Each week, we speak with extraordinary experts and distill everything from scholarly research to self-help books into accessible and digestible daily parenting practices. We're your hosts, Leslie Block and Zoe Bisbing, both New York City-based adolescent eating disorder psychotherapists and mothers of two, here to help you help your children fully bloom. Thank you so much for joining us. Today's episode is brought to you by the ABCs of Body Positive Parenting, our research-packed interactive guide designed for today's busy parent. To learn more about how you can subscribe, please visit fullbloomproject.com. Again, that's fullbloomproject.com. So shall we get to it? Yeah. (laughs) This week, we are talking about beauty specifically beauty sickness, and how we as parents can vaccinate our children against this growing epidemic. We are very excited about today's guest because she literally wrote the book on the topic. Dr. Renee Engeln is an award-winning professor of psychology at Northwestern University where she directs the Body and Media Lab. Her work has appeared in numerous academic journals and her TEDx talk has more than half a million views on YouTube. Renee, we are thrilled to welcome you to the Full Bloom Project. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Wonderful. Well, we are particularly excited to have you here to help us understand what beauty sickness is and how all of our children are at risk of catching it. And we hope we could just start by hearing your definition of what it is. So beauty sickness is what happens when you get so worried about and focused on how you look that you don't have enough time and energy and emotional resources left for the things that actually matter more to you than your appearance. We're curious, you know, how contagious is it? What what does the research say? Mm-hmm. Well, I would say it's contagious and that we catch it from our culture, maybe a little more than we do from each other. So we live in a world that is extremely focused in particular on how girls and women look. It's really hard to get away from it. We get those messages over and over again. And we see that borne out um, in surveys of young girls who by around five or six can already be talking about things like going on a diet, for example, um, well before they even really understand what that means. Um, we saw it recently in a, a survey that came out just in September of 2018. Um, It was of U.S. adolescents, and overwhelmingly, the girls they surveyed said that they still felt like our culture values them for their looks more than anything else. That's how we know that beauty sickness is out there. I know you mentioned girls and women, and are boys immune? I don't think boys are immune, but I think they're protected. There's a set of challenges that boys and men sort of uniquely face in this culture, for sure. But when it comes to beauty culture we treat men and women differently. So girls learn at a pretty young age that their bodies are for looking at, that they're for being pretty. Whereas we teach boys that their bodies are for doing things, that they're instruments, right? That they're for taking risks and using. And so kids pick up on that message pretty early. And then our culture reinforces that message in a lot of different ways. So it's not that little boys never care about how they look or that they don't grow into young men or men who, who might have some pretty significant appearance concerns or even eating disorders. It's that we see higher rates of these issues among girls and women because the social world they're living in is on average so different. Why is it critical that parents understand what I'm going to call the symptoms of beauty sickness? 
part of why we want to understand beauty sickness is because it has some pretty troubling psychological ramifications. So it can contribute to things like depression and anxiety and eating disorders. But even more than that, it has some everyday consequences because every moment you're spending focused on and worried about how you look or trying to take the perfect selfie or editing that selfie before you post it, every one of those moments is a moment taken away from something else you could be doing and something else you could be thinking about. So when we have children who are living in these worlds where they can become so obsessed with how they look, it means they're perhaps not being given enough space to develop their other passions and interests and things that we might really like to see them spending more time on. Is there a place for beauty behavior (laughs) that's not the same thing as this sort of beauty sickness epidemic that we're talking about? I can imagine a lot of parents listening really enjoyed that first trip to the makeup counter with their daughter and that it was a really positive experience. So how can we tell the difference between, yeah. you know, do, do you know what I'm asking? That's a great question. And the first thing I would say, which I maybe should have said from the beginning, is that there's nothing wrong with thinking about how you look. We all do it. We're always going to do it. Um, it's, it's part of our evolutionary heritage. It's part of our culture. And certainly some beauty behaviors can be fun. They can be sources of bonding. And so if you're trying to figure out the difference, there are some questions you could ask yourself. Is this really what you want to be spending your time and money on, right? If you feel stretched for time or money, is this how you want to spend it? Are you doing something because it's enjoyable to you or because you feel like you have to do it? And I think it can be really hard to know the difference. We don't have the privilege of living in a world where our looks weren't under such constant scrutiny. We don't know what that might feel like. And so sometimes some of our beauty behaviors feel freely chosen when maybe they're not. But the best way to figure it out is to experiment. Um, Maybe take one of your beauty behaviors, our products, and sort of think about it and think, well, would I rather do something else? Would I rather spend my money on something else and just see how it feels? In your book, you talk about the way that the brain is sort of programmed to be attracted to beauty. Uh And I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit on the the science of beauty or the science of our pull towards beauty. So we are always going to notice how people look. Um, We process how physically attractive we find a face in milliseconds. It's an incredibly fast process. It's automatic. Um, So if I ever hear someone say, well, I just don't even notice how people look, I think that's not true. (laughs) It's just not true. Um, Our brains evolved to do this because for much of human history, how people looked told us important information about who is safe to approach, who might be contagious with the disease, who might make a good mate. Some of those things aren't so relevant anymore, but we still notice. Those are still the brains that we have. We can't ever really shut that off, but we can turn it down. So we have brains that are sensitive to beauty. They're going to notice how we look, how other people look. But then we live in a culture that has turned that sensitivity up higher than we probably could have ever imagined. We are inundated with messages about beauty, with advertisements, with filtered photos on our social media feeds, with constant talk about bodies and fashion and looks. We have turned what might have been a predisposition to thinking about how people look into a real cultural obsession. So I think It's our job, if we care about future generations, to think about how to turn that volume back down. How do we turn that down as parents and vaccinate, so to speak, our kids from this illness? So I think there are big cultural changes we can shoot for, but that's not my area of expertise. I'm a psychologist, so I tend to focus on individual behavior in part because we have more control over it. So one of the first things we can do is change the climate in our households. I've heard from parents who have decided to make their homes body talk free zones, and I fully support that. Stop criticizing how your own body looks. Stop talking about how attractive or unattractive other people are, who's gained and lost weight or who looks good and who looks bad. And just say, we're not going to do that in our house because we don't think that's what's important. 
We don't think that's what matters. Um, it takes some practice to get in the habit, but you can definitely do that. And when you do that, you leave more room for your children to think about other things and talk about other things. So I think that's a really important step that any parent can make. Even if you look back and you realize you've done a lot of body talk in the past, it's not too late to change it. But your children hear that talk and they're going to model it. So it's important, I think, then to know that that intervention or that parenting strategy can help both on the front end, like if you're listening and you have a three-year-old or a six-month-old that you can sort of commit to creating a body talk free zone Mm -hmm. to promote this, but that it isn't too late. How would you recommend a parent go about that if let's say they have a slightly older child and the parent after listening to this really does want to make a change. Do you have any recommendations for ways the parents can get that conversation going with their kids? If you've got a really young child at home, that's a great opportunity to start from scratch, right? And teach them from the beginning that bodies are for doing and that we take good care of our bodies, right? And that's the only way you think about bodies in your household. Let's say you've got a tween or a teenager, and maybe you're even worried that you might've done some damage. Maybe your daughter has heard you talk about being on and off of diets for years. And you now wonder if that was a great idea. The good news about older children is that they love your honesty. They will love and appreciate your honesty. Take a little time, think about what you want to say and sit down and say, I want to talk with you about something. I think that without meaning to, I've sent you some messages about beauty, about health that haven't been what I really wanted to communicate here's the kinds of things I've said, but here's why I don't want to do that anymore. And maybe we can make a plan together for how to talk about these issues in a healthier way and how to make our house a place where you can really feel a lot of body acceptance and a lot of positivity. And I think most young people will absolutely be on board with that. Parents mess up. Everybody messes up, right? And it's okay for your kids to hear that. In fact, I think you're modeling wonderful behavior when you can say, here's how I think I messed up. Here's how I want to do better. Can you help me with that? And I think if you have a teenager, then you've got a great opportunity to use that sort of unlimited well of rage that teenagers have and help them aim it toward making the world a better place, right? So always ask your teens when they are feeling bad about how they look, the most important question, ask them, who benefits when you feel this way? Who is making money off of your pain, right? Who feels good when you feel bad? Who gets something out of this? And I bet they'll figure it out. I bet they'll come up with some really good answers. And you can use those answers to help move your young people toward activism so that they're not just maybe living in a healthier environment, but they can help to create that world for other people and for the generations that come after them. I want to ask you about something in your book around resources and how much of our resources are being used, particularly as women, towards this beauty sickness and just your thoughts about that. It's hard to even get good numbers when it comes to how many of our financial resources are going toward beauty. I can tell you in the U.S., we spend more on beauty and diet products than education and social services combined. It's a big number. The diet industry is many billions a year. Internationally, you could look at something like the skin whitening industry, which in addition to being sort of dangerous and psychologically unhealthy, um, is also racist at its core. Um, $10 billion a year plus industry around the world. You can see it in the number of sort of treatments that women now feel like they have to get, you know, just to look good enough to walk outside the door. How long are you supposed to spend getting false eyelashes glued to your own or getting your body hair removed or getting a blowout or getting your nails done, right? It's hard to add up all that time and money. And I'm not saying give it all back, right? You probably don't want to give it all back. But I think when we start to remember that our resources are limited, it can really put us in a mind frame of thinking, how do I want to spend my time? How do I want to spend my money? How can I spend my time and money in a way that reflects my values while still being realistic, 
right? I think that's the place we want to move toward, toward finding some balance where our worries about how we look get in line and they get in line behind all the other things we care about more. So it's not that they're going to disappear entirely. We just want to bump them down a few notches. I appreciated what you were saying about the way this looks more globally, because I would expect some people to wonder if beauty sickness really just affects sort of people of privilege. I'm hearing what you're saying is no, like this actually has many different expressions. And I wonder if if that's the case, if you could talk a little bit about the diversity of people that beauty sickness really does affect. So I see beauty sickness affecting women around the world um, of all different races, of different social classes. Um, You can see it in the popularity of eyelid surgery in East Asia or the fact that Brazil has extraordinarily high rates of plastic surgery among the very poor. You can see it, like I mentioned, in skin lightening creams. You can see it in the 400 plus percent increase in things like Botox and fillers and the fact that they're being marketed to younger and younger women. You can see it in hours spent in salons are the way women of color are sometimes mocked or pressured against having natural hair, right? You can see this in all different ways. And you can also see it in the way women are so openly criticized about how they look by people they love, but also by strangers Right. The way we sort of see girls and women's bodies as fair game for commentary, that affects everyone. You know, things like street harassment, for example, do not only happen to, you know, middle and upper class white women of privilege. Um, This world where we treat women's bodies as objects, that's happening to everyone. It's happening everywhere. Timely today. (laughs) Hearing that. Yeah. Yeah. For our parent listeners who who get what you're saying um, or don't, what would you give them as kind of the one thing that they could commit to doing that would be effective in, in promoting their child to fully bloom, to, Mm -hmm. to be effectively vaccinated from beauty sickness to the best extent that's possible. I think one of the best things you can do, one of the best gifts you can give your children Um, that will help them be less worried about how they look is to help them turn their energy toward other things. So to really try to raise them in line with your values. And part of how you do that is by giving your children practice articulating their own values. Ask them big questions, right? Sure, ask them what they did at school that day, but also ask them what kind of person they want to be when they grow up. Um, what their goals are, what they love, what they're passionate about, what they've been thinking about. Show them you take them seriously. Give them real room to develop the parts of themselves that have nothing to do with how they look. And the more energy they can spend on those things, the less energy they have for standing in front of the mirror and feeling bad about how they look. Very, very well said. And I'll be curious to hear what our listeners do with that, like what the practical application of that will look like. Me too. So this has been incredibly enlightening. And I wonder for our listeners that are just getting to know you and are intrigued you know, about what you have to say, like where they can find you, what, just if they want to learn more about your work and about, about the beauty sick Sure. You can go to beautysick.com to learn more. If you're interested more in the research side of things, you can also check out my lab's website, which is bodyandmedia.com. And I'm on Instagram at beauty underscore sick if you want to head there too. Wonderful. Thank you. We'll make sure to include all that on the website as well. Um, Is there anything else that you want to share, Renee, before we wrap up? I guess I just want to say good luck out there. I know it's it's a tough environment for trying to raise healthy, happy, young people, but you can do it. So that's our show. Dr. Engelm's research inspires us to truly notice how many beauty messages we and our children are getting to understand the reality of their harmful consequences, and to be steadfast as parents in supporting our children's goals and interests that do not relate to the quest for beauty. 
We are so grateful for the work of Dr. Engeln and her body and media lab. Please check out her book, Beauty Sick, and her YouTube TEDx talk if you haven't already. Also, follow us on Instagram at Full Bloom Project for more support around how to vaccinate your children from beauty sickness and in turn help them fully bloom. Thank you.